Hey folks, so if you've watched my channel, you'll know that I take a very conservative approach towards fighting male pattern baldness. So what I mean by that is that rather than toy around with concept and theory, I prefer to just look at outcome. And when I first started the good fight against hair loss, I wasted a lot of time and money investing in alleged treatments that were grounded in poorly established science and anecdotes like low-level laser light therapy, topical oils, and other natural remedies that just didn't work for me. And after suffering so many disappointments from these unproven remedies, I finally decided to go on the FDA-approved treatments for hair loss, which are minoxidil and finasteride. And even, though the, even though I have used other things that have worked over the years, this FDA-approved combo that I mentioned is what has given me by far the most results and has helped me maintain my hair for over a decade now. Because of this, I have always deferred to outcome as opposed to theory when it comes to making judgments on what to use to treat hair loss. Now, there are many purported treatments that could theoretically be used to treat hair loss, but theory really doesn't mean shit if you can't test it and get good outcome data, and I have no desire to subject myself to a theoretical treatment when the outcome may be that it doesn't work at all, and I'll have ended up losing ground through using it, and I may not be able to get it back with the proven pharmaceuticals. So that is why I will always trust finasteride and minoxidil the most most, since they have the strongest outcome data to back up the efficacy of their claims as a treatment for male pattern baldness. Now, even though finasteride and minoxidil have remained the gold standard for preventing or even reversing male pattern baldness since at least the early 90s, I think uh, 1992 was when finasteride was approved, and that was actually the second one after minoxidil, uh, one still has to wonder, though, about future treatments in development and how they will compare to existing proven treatments. You know, I wonder if babies born in this decade who have inherited the male pattern baldness gene will grow up having to fight hair loss the same way I and so many other people have, or, you know, maybe they will have access to treatments that are so good that they'll laugh at the notion that men actually had to use finasteride at one point to save their hair. Now, there are many hypothetical future treatments on the horizon, and some are plausible, uh, some are plausible, some are not very plausible due to a level of risk and impracticality that would make a scientific scientific investment not seem very worthwhile. So what I want to do is look at probable future treatments that could realistically be available to, to consumers one day. Now, I've talked about Brizula, which is also known as Clascoterone, and that is an upcoming uh, topical anti-androgen, which shows promising results and may be suitable as an alternative for people who cannot use finasteride. But Clascoterone is just around the corner. It's already finished phase three clinical trials for acne, which means it will probably be on the market before the end of the year with the train name Win Levy. Brizula, which is the train name for Clascoterone marketed to treat hair loss, will become later will become available at a uh, later date because it hasn't even begun uh, phase three clinical trials yet. But being that they are the same drug, basically the same chemical with a different name, uh, we can really expect to see doctors prescribe Win Levy off label for hair loss, especially since no severe adverse side effects have been noted from usage. And you know that's kind of what they do with Dutasteride, which is um, FDA approved for. BPH, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, but doctors will commonly prescribe it off-label for hair loss, even though that's not what it is approved for. So, Class Cotterone looks promising, even though there is some doubt as to its long-term effectiveness since its trials done on human subjects were performed over a period of just six months. So beyond that, there's some questions about how good it is. Uh, but what about beyond that? What else is on the horizon that future generations or even existing sufferers of hair loss could look forward to? Now, there are many things I can talk about, but the treatment I'd like to talk about today is the concept of adipose-derived stem cells for hair loss. So first of all, what is a stem cell? We've all heard of it, but what is it exactly? A stem cell is basically a protocell that can be converted into any cell in the body. As such, stem cells have been researched as potential treatments in many diseases. They can be harvested, harvested from adults, and controversially, they can be harvested from embryos as well. Now, adult stem cells come from blood, bone marrow, and the aforementioned adipose tissue as well. Uh, they have been researched as, as potential treatment for hair loss due to the protective role adult-derived uh, stem cells, otherwise known as ADSCs, play in defending the dermal papilla cells, which are the cells that promote hair growth from damage caused by androgens like dehydrotestosterone, DHT, and testosterone. Uh, now, in vitro studies have shown that ADSCs tested have promoted hair growth in mice, and they have been tested ex vivo, which means on human tissue outside of the human organism, like in a petri dish, and they have been found to actually enhance the, uh, the elongation of hair shafts on human hair organ cultures. But 
What about in uh, in vivo studies performed on actual human beings? I mean, that's the kind of data that really counts, right? Well, leading up to that, let's look at a case study of a 28-year-old woman who, as a child, had her hair ripped out of her scalp when it got stuck while she was riding a carousel, which is horrific to think about, but it also means that she has been missing most of her hair for her entire life, so it's hard to imagine anything at all actually working for her. So. Since her hair loss was due to traumatic injury, conventional hair loss treatments were not an option for her, nor could she elect to have a hair transplant since she didn't have enough available grafts to cover the damaged area. And since she's a woman, she could never have a hair transplanted from other regions of her body, as is the case with uh, body hair transplants in patients who get hair transplants but don't have enough donor grafts in uh, their scalp for optimal coverage, so they'll get hair from other regions of their body. But anyways, she uh, underwent an experimental therapy called autologous adipose transplantation. <laughs> well, I don't know if I pronounced that right, but what that is is that that's a means of treating her hair loss, uh, which utilizes the theory of adipose-derived stem cells, ADSCs that I mentioned, as a mean of treating her trauma-induced hair loss. And the way this particular treatment was performed on the young woman was that she underwent liposuction, where 60 milliliters of her own uh, adipose tissue was harvested from her thigh, with only 40 milliliters being used on the patient, with the other 20 milliliters being stored away for future use. The 40 mill milliliters of adipose tissue was injected directly into the scalp of the patient while under anesthesia, and she reported back after three months for a second injection done with the frozen preserved fat from the first liposuction. Uh, the patient agreed to do a third injection on the sixth month when treatment began because she was optimistic about the procedure, so another Another uh, liposuction was performed and she was injected in the same way as in the first procedure. Now, the patient was very pleased with the results after the six month six months, I should say, and the four physicians who were monitoring her progress also agreed that she showed substantial improvement. Now, up until recently, there have only been case reports of this treatment, but it turns out beyond this one case study, there is also a randomized double-blind controlled study that was just published a month ago. So I was very excited to look into this and see how this study be, can be uh, performed if it's uh, across multiple groups, both uh, controlled and intervention. So. The study was a randomized double-blind placebo control trial that involved 38 patients between the ages of 18 to 59 years old. They were 29 men and 9 women who have androgenic alopecia. The study was done in a referral hospital in South Korea, and none of the subjects were on any existing treatments for male pattern baldness, nor were they on any drugs that can exacerbate hair loss, uh, like steroids, for instance, nor had any of them have ever undergone any kind of hair transplantation surgery, so we can rule out the possibility of any kind of external factors uh, influencing the results of the study. So, what was interesting uh, about the way the adipose tissue was extracted and applied compared to the case study in the subjects is that it wasn't uh, autologous, meaning it wasn't uh, the fat from the actual... So that, that what that means is that the fat didn't come from the subjects, subjects themselves, but rather they were acquired through healthy donors who had consented to adipose cell extraction. Also, rather than having the fat injected directly into the scalp, the fat was put through a centrifuge where its impurities were removed, and then the adipose tissue was suspended in a phosphate-buffered saline which isolated the ADSCs from the adipose tissue, and approximately 130 milliliters of the test material was prepared in a bottle with a solution of 1% ADSC mixed with distilled water for the intervention group, while the control or placebo group received just distilled water because it's placebo. So that means that the ADSCs were formulated into a topical solution that could be applied much in the same way as other hair loss treatments like minoxidil and alpha tradiol, which is much more practical than, say, injecting it, as, in the, as was the case with the case study involving the 28-year-old woman who suffered hair loss as a result of traumatic injury. Now, the treatment group was instructed to apply the ADSC solution twice daily with two, mil two milliliters to the problem areas of the scalp rather than applying it all over, so just to the areas where they were losing hair. And they were instructed to do this uh, every day for 16 weeks and were told to report to the testing center four times so that physicians could monitor their progress. In addition, the subjects were instructed to keep a diary where they would record their progress based on what they saw on a daily basis. So in order to monitor the efficacy of this uh, study, physicians would use a phototrichogram, which is what hair transplant doctors use to measure scalp hair density per square centimeter, and they would use the phototrichogram to measure any changes from baseline hair numbers since beginning treatment and see what progress is made after 8 and 16 weeks of treatment respectively. 
They also uh, used photographs and had an investigator who was not aware of the inter interventions. And they used um, this investigator to uh, rate the changes in the scalp's appearances compared to baseline on what was a seven-point metric score system with negative three being greatly decreased, uh, plus one being unchanged, and it went all the way up to plus three for greatly increased. And this isn't as good of a tool for determining growth compared to a phototrichogram, since a phototrichogram can record the exact level of regrowth of individual strands per cubic square, uh, for, per cubic centimeter, I should say. But it's, it's still nevertheless good to get an individual assessment from an investigator looking at photographs, since the investigator will see changes in scalp density the same way your average person will, like just walking across the street who sees the person. So. Increases in scalp density will really not mean much if it's not substantial enough to be visibly noticeable from an outward perspective, after all, hence the need for an investigator to look at the photos. So on those grounds, the study also made it so the participants themselves would grade their level of self-improvements from scores as low as negative 5, uh, indicating it got much worse, all the way up to positive 10, uh, which would indicate improvement. I don't know why they used a different me uh, scale to uh, measure improvement for the individuals, but um, nevertheless, I still think it's important, it's important to have for the reasons I already stated, but calculating the results across all spectrums for both the intervention and placebo group, four patients ended up dropping out, one uh, from the intervention group and three from the placebo group, which left a total of 34 subjects, which, is, which isn't a huge group, but it's still uh, large enough for what this study was trying to prove, I think. So being that the photo trichogram can give us the most accurate measurement of improvement, uh, let's take a look at the results from that standard. So after 16 weeks of twice daily treatment of ADSCs, the treatment group saw an average increase of about four hairs per square centimeter compared to the placebo group, which had an increase of one hair. And we can probably dismiss that to just the natural antigen phase that the subjects were going through, where we're just growing hair as a result of the uh, hair cycle going through its natural growth cycle. Now, keep in mind, as I already said, this group was not on any other existing hair loss treatments, so we can rule out gains made from existing market treatments like finasteride and minoxidil. Now, the p-value, which is the probability that the difference was due to chance, was 0 0.025, which is less than 0 0.05 which is the gold standard for significant difference, which means that the results of the study were not just due to luck, which is important to note. There was a real treatment effect, but how big an effect is the question. So what kind of regrowth does four hairs per square centimeter give us? Well, the average human scalp is anywhere from 100,000 to 150,000 hairs, and the surface area of an adult scalp is anywhere from 500 to 700 square centimeters. So using mathematics, that means the intervention or treatment group gained an average of anywhere from 2,000 to just 2, 2,800 new hairs. That is pretty underwhelming. Now, it's possible that longer-term treatment would result in higher quantities of regrowth, but until further studies can uh, demonstrate this, I have to conclude that this treatment from both a practical and a utilitarian standpoint is mediocre and vastly inferior to other treatments. So, to give you an example of how it compares to existing treatments, let's take a look at stamoxidine. Now, stamoxidine is a hair growth stimulant, which is uh, considered to be even weaker than 2% minoxidil, but despite being weaker than 2% minoxidil, it has still been shown in studies to regrow about 4,000 hairs after 12 weeks. So even stamoxidine, which is considered weaker than 2% minoxidil, works better than ADSCs in a shorter time frame. And furthermore, minoxidil 5% is uh, a widely available treatment over the counter in most countries, and it has been shown in a meta-analysis to increase hair density by 15 hairs per square centimeter, which works out to about 7,500 all the way up to 10,500 new hairs. So minoxidil, which is cheaper, uh, more practical, uh, absolutely blows fat stem cells out of the water, and I can buy a three-month supply of 5% minoxidil for only 20 US dollars. And to add to that, Indeed, if we look at the results of the investigator and subject evaluations of their hair improvement in the study, uh, neither of them noted any noticeable improvement. So by every metric that was used to uh, judge um, improvements from baseline, whether it be the investigators, the subjects themselves, or the phototrichogram, there was either no improvement or very little improvement. So even though this experiment was interesting, 
and I did enjoy reading it. I don't see this as being practically available as a hair loss treatment for numerous reasons, unfortunately. For one, it doesn't work that well, and we've already established why. Secondly, the extraction process of human adipose tissue presents several problems. For one, you need to have willing donors. The donors can't have any history of diseases which can transfer in fat tissues, and the medical process of harvesting fat takes the skill of a medical professional, which would make meeting demand improbable and prohibitively expensive, unless, of course, we could extract the fat from Jason Blaha's fat ass. So this is one of the f potential future treatments which has been discussed that I think is sadly a bit of a flop and doesn't have the potential to be any kind of game changer in the fight against hair loss, even though it's been shown that it might work a little bit, but not enough to justify how hard it is to acquire and to apply. So there are other potential future treatments which are on the horizon. There's like hair cloning and gene therapy, but all of these are very far off and anyone who thinks they can hold off their hair loss long enough until these treatments are available is putting their hair at a severe risk. Now, I know there are people who don't like what is available today, but the fact of the matter is that finasteride is the best thing we have in the market as a long-term solution for hair loss. And if you are serious about saving your hair, it's best you just use what we already know works rather than hoping for the next magic remedy, which may be decades off. Now, I know a lot of people on hair loss forums as well as other channels on YouTube that talk about hair loss have been latching onto the study with extreme optimism, thinking it's like such great news. But for Christ's sake, people, let's try to show a little skepticism here. Anyone who has been fighting hair loss as long as I have will know that whenever some new breakthrough is announced, some new miracle hair loss remedy, there is about a 99% chance that it's complete bullshit. We are talking about hair loss after all, and hair loss has more scams than perhaps any other industry, second only to maybe the weight loss industry. So, as much as I'd like to share in other people's optimism, the science just doesn't back up the use of ADSC. So please just stick with what we know works. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. See you guys next time and keep fighting the good fight. Take care.